Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, distinguished guests, welcome to the second Berlin Southern Theory Lecture. A very heartfelt welcome from Berlin. Unfortunately, not to Berlin. For many of you who are not in Berlin right now and who are possibly quite far away in different parts of the world, unfortunately, we cannot welcome you to Berlin due to the current and long ongoing Corona circumstances, as you know. But fortunately, due to online technology, we can welcome you to this event wherever you are currently based. The annual Berlin Southern Theory Lecture is presented today for the second time. It was initiated last year as a public event in order to recognize the need to bring out, to bring to public attention here in Berlin and in Germany more widely, important questions, approaches and developments in theory building that have recently been shaped and coined by scholars and thinkers from the global south. Providing fundamental alternatives or rethinking the fundamentals of culture and society on the basis of different perspectives, languages and experiences. These are contributions that are relevant to us all as students and scholars in the social sciences and humanities, whether based in the global south or north, and in an era when overcoming of the dominance of Eurocentric theory is urgently be needed, in spite of this project being underway for some time already. The brief foundational text characterizing this lecture, which is also posted on the flyer for this lecture, reads as follows. The annual Berlin Southern Theory Lecture foregrounds Southern theory and epistemology. It honors diverse starting points and relations from, with, and in, and for, forms of theorizing whose trajectories often depart from dominant Euro-American traditions. Thereby, this lecture series redresses lingering post-colonial asymmetries and aims to decenter and diversify theoretical debates in the social sciences and humanities. The Berlin Southern Theory Lecture is organized by the Institute of Social and Cultural Anthropology of the Freie Universität Berlin and the Leibniz Zentrum Moderne Orient. In cooperation with the Forschungscampus Dahlen and Olibri, a research initiative on conceptual collaboration, living borderless research interaction between members of Humboldt University and Freie University. We gratefully acknowledge support from the Berlin Center for Global Engagement within the Berlin University Alliance. We take this also opportunity also to thank all our colleagues and staff who have helped to prepare and organize this event for the reliable support in the process from its beginnings. In particular, I'd like to mention Sandra Calkins, Christina Mashimi, Lena Herzog, and Christoph Marx. Let me briefly add a few technical points to our setup tonight for this evening. We will be welcoming questions and comments from the audience later on, and these can either be sent to us through the Q&A communication as written notes, or you can raise your virtual hands and will be called upon to ask your question. In either case, please identify yourselves briefly, also with name and institutional affiliation when you do so. Please also note, as we've just heard, that this event is being recorded, but you cannot be seen as audience in any case. So then, again, in the name of all organizers, I'm happy to welcome you to, to tonight's lecture by Professor Pratama Banerjee, and beyond that, I'm most happy and honored to be welcoming Pratama Patterji herself, here with us from Delhi, virtually online, and I thank her again for having accepted our invitation. So let me briefly introduce our speaker. Pratama Banerjee is Professor at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, CSDS, in Delhi. She is, is a historian by training and conducted her PhD research at SOAS, University of London, in the Department of History. Before joining CSDS, she was based at the University of Delhi, teaching at Miranda House. Her work has drawn from and in turn is contributing to the fields of political philosophy, cultural history, the history of concepts and literary studies. A comment on her first book, which is entitled Politics of Time, Primitives and History Writing in Colonial Society from 2006 encapsulates this. It says there that she, and I quote, 
straddles the worlds of history, anthropology, sociology, and post-colonial studies with remarkable dexterity. In our introduction to this book, we can find the following memorable characterization of colonial modernity. Quote again, with modernity, the world reappears in a strange and unprecedented way as an agglomeration of coexistent yet non-contemporary beings. For the anthropologists among us, this resonates with Johannes Fabian's critical argument in Time and the Other. Katana Banerjee's work covers an impressive range of topics and hereby issues of social justice are often central to what is sought through. And so is an interest in conceptual histories and epistemological traditions from South Asia and the Global South. The regional examples in her work transcend beyond the history of the region into illuminating the limits and possibilities of conceptual engagements across regions. This is pursued with a view to the prospect of a decolonized future. Her focus includes readily and ably the pre-colonial era on the outlook for conceptual reservoirs for the reframing of our analytic language. Her texts have inspired a good number among us, whether with regard to the political dimensions of time or thinking critically across traditions. Her new monograph, called Elementary Aspects of the Political Histories from the Global South, is now forthcoming with Duke, in the coming month actually, and it promises exciting takes on historical usages of the political with a view to specific conceptual examples taken from South Asia. Now, let me, in conclusion, just share with you one sentence from an introduction to that book, a PDF of which of that introduction is also on the website. One sentence which may also set the scene, I think, for tonight's lecture. There, she states that while she writes from or about her particular location, just Bengal, India, South Asia, or the Global South more widely, her aim is not to demonstrate difference, nor to stake a claim to theory as such, as she says, but rather, as she emphasizes, to mobilize other histories in order to open up new theoretical and conceptual possibilities for all to think about and debate, end of quote. And with this, I think I would like to end my introduction. So Professor Banerjee will now present her lecture which will last approximately five minutes. After that, our moderator, my colleague Hans Jörg Dillia, professor and chair of the Institute of Social and Cultural Anthropology here at Freie Universität, will introduce our discussant, Professor Abdul Kader Tayyub from the University of Cape Town, South Africa, who will then proceed with his comments for about 10 minutes. And after that, we shall be opening up for discussion and comments from the audience for about 30 minutes. So please join me now in welcoming Professor Banerjee to present her lecture entitled Time and the Limits of the Political Anti-Historical Excursions from South Asia. Thank you very much. It's a great honor uh, to be giving this Southern Theory public talk today at Berlin. Um, and Sincere thanks to my Berlin colleagues and Kai, and also for this generous and uh, insightful introduction to my work. So, let me begin by stating up front what I understand by Southern theory. Southern theory comes after the moment of post-colonial and decolonial criticism. Post-colonial and decolonial criticism has shown up Euro-American theory's provincial nature, negated its universalist claims, and exposed its complicity in regimes of colonial power and violence. As importantly, however, it has shown up the complicity of the nation form in colonial technologies of rule, 
making it impossible for us to expose any kind of epistemological nationalism or nativism. Southern theory, therefore, is decidedly not Indian or Chinese or African theory set out in opposition to Euro-American theory. Instead, I see it as a mode of breaching intellectual borders in their geopolitical as well as disciplinary forms, which we have inherited from colonial modernity and its nationalist afterlives. Southern theory in that sense is a mode of thinking across traditions and above all, and this is the main burden of my argument today, Southern theory is thinking against the grain and push of history. Not only because history as a discipline reproduces colonial national subjects, but also because Southern theory must transcend claims of historical difference and acquire, if not a universal, then at least a trans-historical salience. Southern theory, therefore, must think across and against the colonial modern division of time into ancient, medieval, and modern historical periods, which I believe lies at the very foundation of Euro-American theories, theory hegemony across the globe. Which is why I use somewhat provocatively the term anti-historical in the title of my talk. To put it in other words, while Southern theory is made possible by historical critique, decolonial and post-colonial, without which there is no emancipation from the prison of the present, as it were, it inevitably shades off into a certain creative play with time and chronology, bringing together pasts and possibilities in counterintuitive assemblages against the logic of historical necessity. That modernity is a temporal principle is well known. It is also well known that this temporal principle has the following aspects. One, an eschatological aspect of linear and determined progress towards the future. Two, a spatializing aspect, a la Kant, by which time is rendered into a mirror image of space, an a priori extension to be filled in by historical events post facto. Three, a historical aspect of the asymmetrical periodization of the world into ancient, medieval, and modern times in which modernity appears as an endless extension with every generation being modern, more modern, and yet more modern ad nauseum, such that the end of modernity, unlike the end of antiquity or the Middle Ages, appears imaginable only as the end of history. Four, a governmental aspect by which non-European peoples and non-European lands are administered as non-contemporaries, that is as primitives and backwards, subject to regimes of modernization, progress and development, including by their own nation states. Five, an epochal aspect by which the classical term epoch is transformed from meaning a critical or an originary event to meaning a temporal unity, a duration like antiquity or modernity, to which, as the German term Zeitgeist implies, 
the whole world must confirm in spirit despite the empirical diversity of temporal experiences. And six, above all, the aspect of universal chronology based on the colonial subsumption of all calendars of the world under a secularized biblical chronology and the Gregorian calendar. Now scholars have deconstructed the historicism and the progressivism that underpin modern regimes of power. But we are yet to adequately think through the concept of time as such. Time as that intractable object of thought and experience, which both grounds and limits our imaginations of the political. In today's presentation, therefore, I seek to recover time from modernist and historicist discourses and return it to political thought. In the process, opening up the very concept of time to indeterminacy. I invoke multiple intellectual traditions from South Asia, which saw the confluence of Indic, Islamic, as well as diverse heterodox thought traditions through the centuries. My main argument today is that bringing the question of time center stage via a diversity of non-European and non-modern thought traditions forces us to breach the modern day analytical divisions between politics and religion, public and private, event and life, and indeed the human and the non-human. Temporal thinking in South Asia is a vast subject. In the short time that I have here, I can only give you a glimpse of the diversity and complexity of this field. Suffice it to say that the story of time in South Asia unfolds in three registers. The first register is that of multiple chronologies and calendars and associated political offices. Not only the king or the sultan who was charged with reading the signs of the times and maintaining the balance of cosmic forces by just rule, but also specialized time experts, often employed by the court and the mosque, whose task was to translate between diverse chronologies and calendars, not unlike pre-colonial translators of languages. The second was the register of mythologies, of which the most well-known is the epic tradition of the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata propounded Kalavada or the doctrine of time as the principal driver of the world. The Mahabharata became a popular text for not only the Mughals, but also anti-colonial activists, including Gandhi in later centuries. Then there were Puranic traditions, stories of the past foretold, which spoke of the moral decline of epochs through time, with the last epoch being the time of absolute normative crisis when unprecedented political phenomena, such as the rise to power of low castes, untouchables, and even women became possible. An imagination that inspired a number of popular rebellions, 
in the 19th and the early 20th century against colonial rule. There were also Buddhist mythologies and stories that informed kingship in Southeast Asia with regnal cycles measured in terms of Buddha's birth cycles. The Buddha having been born multiple times and in multiple species, including king, untouchable, and indeed animal, before he could achieve universal compassion and become the Buddha. At play were also Central Asian and Islamic traditions of Insane Kamil, the perfect individual who could be the universal ruler or the Sufi saint, who appeared on earth as the Lord of the conjunction of stars and planets and guided humanity towards eventual cosmic harmony and millennial justice. The great anti-colonial insurgency of 1857 was animated by this cosmological futurism involving king, god, stars, and time itself. Then there were also more subaltern mythologies. For instance, the tradition of the worship of the void or Shunya in Eastern India, popular amongst untouchables, which rested on the principle that death, nothingness and void were the essence of the world and that social identities were therefore utterly accidental and contingent. The third register of the unfolding of the story of time in South Asia was the register of philosophies. In the classical Indic tradition of philosophy, for example, at stake was the question of causality. The question whether an effect was conceptually reducible to its cause or simply a mutation of a pre-existing cause or indeed an entirely new entity distinct from and autonomous of the cause. This debate regarding the nature of pre-existence and novelty had a bearing on how to epistemologically grasp the real or the existent, such as in terms of whether time itself was real, a self-standing entity, because it had unmistakable causal efficacy, or was time merely a conceptual extrapolation from the experience of changing matter. In Buddhist and Jain traditions of philosophy, on the other hand, time was a series of discrete moments and therefore reality a ceaseless flux. In the grammatical tradition, time was a quality inherent in language and predicated upon the tense structure of human expression and narration. In Islamic philosophies of time, a critical issue was the problem of infinite regress. That is, whether it was possible to think about the beginning or the end of time, given that notions of origin and end presuppose yet another prior level of time. Atomism was also intensely debated especially by the Asharites, leading to a conception of the instant as an absolute and self-standing moment, such that the movement between moments was imagined as leaps 
or interruptions rather than as any form of continuity. Making each instant the locus of absolute creative freedom, as it were. In Sufi thought, in turn, time was that which emerged in the encounter between God's eternity and human momentariness, both being beyond phenomenological grasp. Time was thus thinkable only as a relationship between the contrary human experiences of infinity and mortality. The point of this hasty account of diverse chronologies, mythologies, and philosophies of time is to quickly set aside the conventional way in which traditions of time in non-European contexts have been classified in modern thought. Namely, in terms of a universal binary between cyclical and linear, predestinarian and progressive, pagan and Christian, non-modern and modern. Even in just the one region of South Asia, it is clear that time was articulated in diverse, incommensurable ways and rarely ever as cyclical. In the longer paper that I have shared with Professor Tayob, I discuss this diversity in greater detail. Here, I just draw out from this diverse field a set of four implications that has salience for how we think the political in our times. The first and the most obvious implication has to do with the register of chronology. We often forget that in non-modern times, societies functioned routinely with multiple chronologies and multiple calendars, depending on the nature of activities undertaken, ritual, political, congregational, agrarian, and so on. Modernity universalized chronology and subjected the whole world to one single calendar. This had two consequences. One, there emerged a temporally inflected division between public life and inner life, between politics and religion, because it was henceforth assumed that colonized peoples would conduct their religious and ritual activities according to traditional almanacs and traditional calendars while conforming across the whole world to the Gregorian calendar for purposes of public life, that is, work and politics. And two, with the rise of universal chronology, chronology came to be identified with time itself in everyday common sense, creating a permanent category confusion for us moderns. For we forgot that time is not chronology. Chronology is merely succession, merely the relationship of before and after. Time, on the other hand, is about transformation and therefore about how we understand the reality and the materiality of the world that we seek to transform. The second implication derives from mythologies of time, which almost always co-theorize the spiritual and the political. 
The epic tradition of Mahabharata, which I mentioned, which is a story about a world war leading to the destruction of the political class as a whole, raises the fundamental question of the limits of the political. It sets up a homology between personal existential time of mortality, loss and finitude and the political time of rise and fall, victory and defeat, both metaphorized by the classical game of dice. The basic question at stake here is as follows. Political efficacy, by definition, involves violence, even fratricidal violence, violence against one's own people. Is not politics then necessarily about death, sacrifice and war? If so, is not renunciation a better form of life than kingship? In this epic tradition, therefore, the spiritual mastery of the ascetic and the political mastery of the ruler, renunciation and revolution are seen as two sides of the same coin. Mythologies of time in South Asia thus not only question the modern day divisions between religion and politics, spiritual and secular, they in fact gesture towards an ontological sharing, ontological overlap between the spiritual and the political. This ontological sharing derives from the fact that political struggle is ultimately an act of radical risk taking, which must engage questions of mortality, finitude, failure and meaninglessness. That is which must engage with the work of time and eventually arrive at a limit beyond which the question becomes purely existential, shading into a spiritual journey towards the radically unknown future. It is not accidental, therefore, that by legend, the Buddha was born into a warrior lineage. Having encountered amongst his subjects four canonical moments of the work of time, destitution, disease, aging, and death, he finally chose renunciation in the place of kingship, even as, even as paradoxically, Buddhism went on to become a royal ideology for the first empire in South Asia, the Maurya Empire. The third implication I want to draw is that mythologies of time not only co-theorize the existential, the spiritual and the political, but also the cosmological and the political. Myth is an expressive form that brings together within the same narrative, stars and planets, gods and ancestors, humans and animals, the disorienting space of forests, and deserts and the strategic spaces of courts and cities. Thus upping individual human drama to cosmic, we shall today say planetary scale with the political working as the necessary mediating moment. And myth plays with time, not just by referring to time directly, Time is in fact a personified character in Mahabharata, but also by playing with the narrative mode. The Mahabharata is a series of flashbacks, wherein each time of telling 
is embedded in yet another time of telling intended to produce the necessary interface across the different scales of experience, intimate, political, and cosmological. It is also for this reason that in non-modern imaginations, political events and cosmic events, such as political tyranny and natural calamity, are understood to accompany each other. And times of political transition are seen as marked by cosmic aberrations like earthquakes, meteorites, and epidemics, which instantly rings a bell for us today. Not surprisingly, as the historian Afzar Moin shows, the Mughal emperor in Delhi was known as the Lord of Conjunction of Stars and Planets. The poet philosopher Muhammad Iqbal, writing in the 1930s, his magnum opus, The Reconstruction of Religion in Islam, criticized the subject object and the idealism materialism binary of modern thought. He argued that matter itself was a spiritually and temporally imbued concept. Matter, he said, was a process, a set of time events. Iqbal disputed the theological division between God and his creation, which led to the imagination of a one-time creator who withdraws from the world, letting it function via eternally fixed natural laws, which is true for science for all times to come. Instead, Iqbal posited God's creation as by definition unfinished. It was the unfinished and unpredictable nature of matter as creation that was the source of both divine and human freedom and offered a political opening towards unknown futures. In fact, Iqbal assigned a self to everything, distinguishing various forms of matter and species only in terms of degrees of selfhood. All things created by God, he said, has memory and potentiality. He quoted the Sufi poet Iraqi, who spoke of infinite varieties of time corresponding to infinite gradations of being between pure materiality and pure spirituality. For Iqbal Das, it was not just human society, but the cosmos itself that had to be imbricated in the project of political transformation. A neo-materialist position, if any, as we are rediscovering in the 21st century when faced with the geological and biological implications of our own politics. The fourth and the last implication, and here I move to philosophies rather than mythologies of time, has to do with the question of the very nature of reality. In South Asia, a number of anti-colonial thinkers of the 20th century mobilized different aspects of traditional philosophies of time for the purpose of modern politics. Precisely by reopening the question of the real in ways other than the modern day realism, materialism versus idealism binary. Revolutionaries, for example, who espoused a politics of violence and sacrifice 
participated in a phenomenological debate about time. They argued that human agency was necessarily circumscribed by the release of unintended and unknown consequences and by the ever-present possibility of interruption, incompletion, and failure. It was therefore an error to think of political action in terms of teleological action, in terms of consequences. It was also erroneous to think of the political subject as an autonomous and empowered ego. On the contrary, they argued, political action called for spiritual disciplines that helped cultivate a non-self, a non-subject, an empty subjectivity hospitable to the passage of time through it. For time, they said, harking back to older debates, time was the only real, the only force with absolute causal efficacy. Changing the world was thus a matter of subjecting oneself to the force of time, which required the release of the self from the immediacy of context and an in intensification rather than sublation of the human experience of mortality and finitude. At the very other extreme, the constitutionalist, philosopher, and leader of ex-untouchables, B.R. Ambedkar, mobilized in the 1950s Buddhist philosophy in order to argue just the opposite. The Buddhist theory of time as a discrete series of instants implied that the existent at any one moment was utterly incommensurable to the existent at any other. In other words, identity was a philosophical impossibility. Hence, the existential principle of Dukkha, the suffering and instability that marked human life in the world, and the anti-foundationalist doctrine of the void and of dependent origination, that's a technical term from second century Buddhist philosophy, dependent origination, that posits that entities exist only in their mutual causal interdependence and never autonomously as substance or essence. Ambedkar mobilized the Buddhist notion of the void and the doctrine of dependent origination in order to argue against caste identity by birth and to propose a theology of mutual social responsibility. Because there was no God and no transcendental self, no soul, Ambedkar argued, all we are left with in this world is an ethics of responsibility, of owning up the causal force of our everyday actions and their consequence for others. Ambedkar's project of equality was therefore no more and no less than a theology of everyday human life without foundation in either a god or a nation or a state all of which, he argued, partook in the kind of timeless presence slash essence which Buddhist philosophy fundamentally denied. To conclude, can one then argue that politics is impossible to think without thinking about the intractability and alterity of time and human attempts to overcome it. Perhaps one can even say, rather commonsensically, that if there could be 
any universal definition of politics at all, it would be that politics is a mode of activity that seeks to ride or play time in favor of the political agent. Be it the sovereign or the community or the rebel. The modern conception of progress is just one recent example of this. And because this question of the finite, this que and because this enterprise of making time one's own cannot be distinguished from the quotidian, the everyday question of the finite and mortal human condition, as well as the cosmological question of human limits in the face of other species and other existence, politics inevitably stumbles into what we today call religion. At stake here is what I have been calling an ontological sharing between the political and the existential, so beautifully elaborated in non-modern traditions of the world, not only in South Asia, but in many other regions, but which modernity brushed under the carpet by rendering it pre-modern and archaic. Now this ontological sharing is very different from Carl Schmitt's political theology. The understanding that our contemporary political orientation is a secularized version of an earlier religious orientation. The ontological sharing between the political and the existential or spiritual, as I'm calling it, drawing from non-modern mythologies and philosophies of time, does not release the political from ethical or social constraints. It does not render the political as primary, autonomous, and therefore the most empowered imperative of human society. This ontological sharing does quite the opposite it actually indexes the limits of the political based on the constitutive indeterminacy of both time as a concept and politics as a practice of radical risk taking. The Marxist anthropologist Maurice Godelia discussing the ineffable nature of the sacred says that the sacred works by, and I quote here, an occultation of reality and an inversion of the relationship between cause and effect. A description, I think, that works equally well for our contemporary idea of free and undetermined political action transcending the prison of the present and ushering in the future against the necessities of history. One wonders what is the Marxist sensibility of the real as auto-driven by a dialectic of internal contradictions, if not another kind of occultation of reality, like Iqbal's occultation of matter as animate and intentional, and Ambedkar's occultation of reality as a void. Equally relevant to us is Godelier's insight that the sacred engages in unknown and dangerous forces, such that the becoming sacred of a human agent, be it the millennial sovereign of Mughal imagination or the death-defying warrior hero of popular lore or the Leninist vanguard who is ahead of his times 
is not only to dramatically transcend one's given social position, but also to transgress into a domain of absolute risk and radical unknowability, constitutive no less of political practice than of spiritual journeys. The task of Southern theory, I would then end by saying, is to recover these lost and past insights and bring them to bear upon our contemporary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Banerjee, for your highly inspiring lecture. It is a shame that we are not able to hear the actual clapping of the audience right now, but I'm certain that there is a strong virtual applause in this very minute. <laughs> Before there will be the opportunity for the audience to ask questions, I would like to introduce the discussant of this evening, Professor Abdul Kader Tayyop. Professor Tayyop currently holds the chair of Islam, African Publics and Religious Values at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. He is currently also the holder of a Georg Foster Research Award by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation with the Leibniz Zentrum Moderne Orient here in Berlin. Previously, that is from 2002 to 2006, he held one of four professorial chairs at the Institute for the Study of Islam in the Modern World, ISIM, in the Netherlands. With his elaborate research on the interface between religion, Islam and ethics, for instance, with regard to the fields of education and schooling, popular culture or activists' cult um, ethical engagements, Professor Tayyop's research has set standards for the study of contemporary uh, or the, for the study of uh, contemporary Islam in South Africa and Africa more widely. Furthermore, however, Professor Tayyop's work also has general conceptual and methodological implications far beyond the field of religious studies, which resonate equally well with the themes of Professor Banerjee's lecture today. Thus, his recent research is particularly interested in rethinking opportunities and potentials that are not reliant upon the currently dominant Western schools of thought in order to forge and use, use new spaces for the reconceptualizations of key terms and methods in the social sciences and religious studies. With this approach of provincializing the Western canon with terms that emerge in a different intellectual tradition, he does not aim to replace one hege hegemony with another, but to ask questions that have the potential to challenge and transform the habits and power structures of contemporary academia. As Professor Tayop has put it, and I quote him here, this new theoretical horizon offers a new a way out of the Eurocentric focus in the academy that has been under sustained attack, but which thus far has offered few avenues for novel inquiry. I'm committed to the intellectual effort of pushing the boundaries of the social and human sciences in a direction that forges new ways of thinking about religion as a category and about religions as global phenomena. Among the many publications of Professor Tayyop are the following monographs, Islamic Resurgence in South Africa from 1995, Islam in South Africa, Mosques, Islam Sermons, Imam Sermons from 1998, and Religions in Modern Islamic Discourse from 2009. But now let me extend a very warm welcome to Professor Tayyop. I look forward to your comments in response to Professor Banerjee's lecture. The floor is yours, Abdul Kader. So thank you very much for this. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, reading the, the paper and also the introduction to your forthcoming book. So uh, it gave me a good insight on, uh, on, on uh, at least a, a good insight on how you're working with, uh, you know, thinking through uh, concepts of the political, but also I think in a way that uh, uh, basically you know, if I think about the trajectories of the anti-colonial, of the post-colonial, uh, as you mentioned, for example, I think you, in a, I think your lecture uh, points the way to the future, uh, in a way to accept the critique of the political, uh, and actually going beyond that by putting some things on the table, 
and uh, asking us to interrogate them and asking us to look at them to appreciate them anew. And I think that having listened to your radio paper and also listened to the lecture now, I think you've done that very well. Um, I think it's quite interesting. I'm not a political scientist, but I, I mean, you cannot avoid thinking about, about political, like you said in your in your paper. I think what you said about South Asians is also something about, uh, you know, Africans or South Africans in particular. Uh, sometimes we do think that we are so political, we cannot think outside the political. But I think it is it is one of those places from which one should actually begin. Um, one of the things that I've, in my own work, I've often thought about uh, the study of religion and when you know, if thinking about the development of the study of religion, often a lot is made out about how uh, the challenges of science actually leads the development of, uh, you know, um, theories in the study of religion, whether you speak about Immanuel Kant or you talk about uh, later 19th century thinkers or even somebody like Wittgenstein, basically science is always a kind of a model, always a kind of a threat. And yet when you, when I take over these ideas, and I think this is what you're doing very successfully, um, you think that, okay, I, I do accept that, you know, the scientific world actually poses challenges to our way of thinking about the world, but that's often not the first point of call. I mean, that's not often the first point that you think about. And it's often colonial, col coloniality, or at least a political hegemony that you have to confront first before you can get to, you know, whether you, and I think that that kind of, the way that I read the paper, I think it invites us to think about the political and it's a good place to start to begin to uh, question, uh, as you did, uh, you know, through thinking about time. And I think choosing the the metaphor, or the or maybe the not the metaphor, but perhaps the, the, the idea of time, the concept of time, uh, I think, uh, for me at least, uh, opens up the space. You, you know, the, the the decision to do something that you want to start from politics. I think that is a, a strategic, but also necessary to, uh, position. But uh, choosing time means that you moving out of the out of the kind of you know it's uh, it's 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 not this is not my way so you can have an alternative politics, but to think of time gives the alternative politics without actually being connected with you know with mm -hmm. a particular po politics of modernity. So I'd like to begin with um, um, with your 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 paper in which I I've read it. I mean I listened to your paper, your presentation as well, and I thank you for sharing that with me. But I'm going to point out to way the way that I saw you. Uh, you know, presenting the word. Let me just go ahead and, and read my, some of my comments. So first you shared with us some with some reflections, I think, opening, thinking about modernity as spatial. And just when I thought that I would disagree with you, you immediately said it's temporal as well. So I find it interesting in how you present, you know, you went from the spatial, spatial to the temporal. So in a, in a sense, I thought of it as an editorial process because obviously I didn't hear you say that say it now, but I want to bring it back here because, you know, because I've read it, so I'm going to ask you the question. Is there a sense in which the, set, the in which the spatial, that means colonization, is more obvious than the temporal mark of the rhythms of the markets, the factories, the schools? Because obviously time is very important, like you said, but I was intrigued that you first started with the obvious to say, well, modernity is spatial, but then you immediately uh, you know, to confirm that it is temporal as well, I think, which is your which is your paper. So my first question is, what is the relation between the spatial and the temporal in modernity? Does the temporal come after the spatial, confirming it, or does the temporal anticipate the spatial? Is there is there a set special significance in your editorial process, whether you wrote it out a little later, but I sort of noticed it, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you that as such. But obviously, I think your paper does not dwell only on the modern. I mean, the modern is in the in the is the in the, in the background. But I think the first point that you shared with us is the reality of alternative, uh, you know, of alter, uh, alternative temporal orders. In particular, you point out point out to the reality of multiple temporal orders in the past, in pre, pre colonial times in South Asia, and maybe in, and I think you're right elsewhere as well. So. The, fall, the question that I want to follow up based on what you've given us, does a plurality disappear in the modern or is a, is a kind of a hierarchy introduced in temporal orders? Mm -hmm. So in the presentation, I get the sense that we may speak of a multiple, you know, temporal orders in modernity as well. But so therefore the temporal orders of cultures, you know, with capital C or maybe culture with a, with a lowercase C, 
So Mozart or musical genres, you know, classical musical genres, and perhaps religious pilgrimages, which are very temporal, are related to a dominant modern temporal order, but in very distinctively ordered ways. So I think your papers begin to, I mean, in, in addition to, you know, obviously, I, I come to the, the pre-modern in a minute, but I think your paper also raises questions about the temporal orders in the, in, in the modern as well. Uh, your, your presentation led me to think of a dominant temporal order within which other temporalities may be accommodated and perhaps other tem some temporalities which are not permitted. So, and I think that, give, that looking at, so therefore looking at time uh, gives us a sense of these hierarchies in a way that would, uh, uh, you know, would, that would uh, evade our attention as such. So I think it's a very important, you know, testimony or it is a meditation on the modern as temporal and or the political model as temporal and therefore opening up discretion of the hierarchies. If I go on to you know, the main part of your paper, when we think about, you know, time in pre-modern uh, epochs and pre-modern regimes as you've helped us to do. So, how do you think about the different temporal orders? So you basically mentioned the pluralities, and I think you're perfectly right. But I wanted to you know, ask you to think about whether there is a different hierarchy or different kind of arrangement of these pluralities. So if one asks the question, like you pointed out in the Islamic or the Indic Islamic traditions in this kind of, you know, whether the king or the sultan, as you mentioned, you know, how do they sort of relate the different temporalities? You mentioned the idea that they are related to specific specific practices. Mm -hmm. So do you, are you, you know, are you putting forward a kind of a plural, a, what kind of pluralism are you suggesting? Well, I would like to follow that up perhaps with something that I've come up to read recently um, about Ottoman and other medieval Islamic states, for example. There seems to be a suggestion now in the literature that we should look at these uh, states as rather as cosmopolitan than they were previously thought as, and it accords exactly what, what you are saying. Mm -hmm. But in this revision, sometimes one gets the sense that the Islamic is a single signifier, which is standing outside this kind of, you know, regime. Because if you think about Islamic as being determined by a juristic calendar or a theological calendar, not necessarily a Sufi or perhaps a, a theological one that you say, then sometimes the Islamic is placed outside it. But I think that is that I think that sometimes becomes a hangover from previously because because these regimes were called Islamic as part mm -hmm. of ident identitarian politics. But if one begins with temporalities, multiple temporalities as a as, as a kind of a normative, then maybe we need to start thinking about the relationship between the different, you know, in say, for example, in, in the way that you select you, you suggested, you know, in the Indic Islamic, uh, the Mughal Empire, for example, or there was a clearly a Islamic related to the mosque, or maybe the, uh, the, the, the translations of the Mahabharata, for example, by, mm -hmm. and then the, the avatar of, uh, you know, Akbar, for example, being the avatar of the, of, of, I think that I'd like to, you know, ask whether we can start uh, interrogating these particular temporalities and how do they work? I suppose that you cannot be done in one lecture, but I think it, your, your paper raises questions about the relationships. So some, I was thinking about the, of the modern as particularly hierarchical, and I wanted to ask whether we can think about something different or different kinds of relationships. I mean, I think you alluded to the question that it has to do with uh, practices. So is it something to do with function or is it something more, uh, also that's the question that I'm asking. <clears throat> I think your, your next exploration takes us to the mythologies and the philosophies of time. I think I'm going to collapse them. I think you, you identify them, but both provide opportunities to think about time as marked by significance and not as abstractions. So your essay presents a reading of the Mahabharata, which you, which you, which you link to a series of what we can call religious texts. And I think that's quite important to mention that not as one text, but there's a whole lot of texts before. So the, the epochs in the Mahabharata point to a quality of time as destructive or threatening in a material and moral sense, but also pregnant with new possibilities. And I think these two sides, the destructive and the possible, are interesting in that they bring the religious, the mythological and the political, but also the personal, as you pointed out, in close conversation with each other. And more interesting, I think not more interesting, but I think what was what was fascinating, which I didn't, I read, uh, you know, uh, um, Islamic writers, particularly Muslim writers in the 19th century, but I didn't see that connection. But I think I have to read them again. But I think it, it sort of uh, 
by pointing to the to to seeing how the anti-colonial writers were drawing on this on this reg, on these registers, I think is an opportunity to start thinking again about what these anti-colonial movements were all about. So I, I think that is particularly important to rewrite the somewhat somewhat the modern history as well, not only the medieval medieval history. And I think these readings surely may be compared with the endless future of modernity. It reminds us of the temporal significance of modernity, of hope and promise, which is also pregnant in, in its meaning, right? To have hope and promise of, a, of everlasting future. Perhaps what we what, what we had with colonial conflict was a clash of temporal temporal regime regimes mm -hmm. as much with special as special occupation. I think that's something that comes out very clear. But the, the, the last point that I wanted to sort of begin to raise is that perhaps the, the modern is not as abstracted as it, as, as it appears to be, the modern idea of time. So when you interrogate the way that you've interrogated the idea of temporality in modern times and you basically unmask it, you basically see the significance, especially because you see it connected to the state or the global modern state and its visions and its sense of hope and its promise, for example. I think that we can begin to see this as somewhat mythological, mythological as as mythological as the other at the time as well. But then my final comment is perhaps, and this is a perhaps a kind of a mischievous one. I, I'm going to try and put it forward to you in a in a way. I sort of I was asking myself, what is your paper all about? Is it a kind? Is it constructed in a kind of a in a, in a kind of a, a time as abstracted or time as significant. Somehow, I think it seems to me that you need this idea of time as abstraction in order to make an alternative point. That you need to sort of abstract, think about the word T-I-M-E, in this English term as such. And in, before you even begin to think about it in its mathematical or physical sense as duration, one already puts it up some way somewhere as I, maybe maybe that's not called abstraction maybe but i think it is something different from what is happening in modernity and what is happening in pre-modern regimes as such and is it then useful is it necessary i think to think about this kind of a third term that we need in order to begin to talk about these kind of differences or these kind of temporalities as such or do you think that we should just go from one significance to another and perhaps that or do you have any other ideas of how to do this kind of comparative work. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this. It was very inspiring and very useful to think through politics and to think through, uh, uh, you know, the challenges of the decolonial, you know, by coming out of the kind of oppositional discourse, but also then to start thinking from a different place. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tayop, uh, for your comments. Um, I would uh, like to give the opportunity to Professor Banerjee to briefly respond. Um, but before uh, you do so, um, I would uh, just like to repeat the instructions for asking questions. Um, so if you want to ask questions, everybody's invited um, to do so. And you can, can ask your questions via um, the chat. Um, and uh, uh, please uh, do introduce yourself very briefly in one sentence who you are. Um, and uh, also uh, let us know if you want to um, ask the question in person or if I should read them uh, for you. Um, so um, everybody can submit their questions via the chat now, but um, for, for now, um, Professor Banerjee, uh, yeah, you have the opportunity to respond um, to the comments. So thank you very much. Uh, if, if I may call you Abdul Kader now. Yes, yes. Now that we have read each other's work. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for this engaged uh, reading of my uh, essay and for actually asking some very important questions and difficult ones, I have to uh, admit. The first one, space and time. Now, one answer would be that while territory, territory is still contested in today's time, in our times, the nation state, borders, border policing, securitization, citizenship, it's, it's all a battle for territory. So the space question in some senses remains still open. The time 
question is far more naturalized. In other words, the contention over time is very meek and uh, pretty much uh, repressed. The reason why I concentrate on, I mean, I have a particular interest in talking about time mm -hmm. is because that even when we contest borders and even when empires get deterritorialized, so the earlier colonial empires no longer exist, uh, nevertheless, while space is still battled over, we have not even started battling over time or right to think time in different ways. Because the imagination of, you know, more ancient medieval modern, the imagination of progress, the imagination of development has become almost entirely universalized. So that's one answer that I would uh, uh, offer. But there is, I think, uh, a more complicated answer, uh, complicated response, which I'm still thinking about, but can't, so can't give a definitive response here. I think it is a mod, it's an inheritance of modernity to think of time and space as twin concepts. Twin concepts that are in some ways logically and qualitatively correlated. So whenever we think time, we immediately tend to think space, as if time and space, as Kant said, are the two basic a priori's. I would actually question that. I would say that space is not the other of time, nor is space the correlate of time. These are extension and transformation are concepts of completely different orders. And I'm only beginning to think very provisionally and hesitatingly that perhaps time and language are qualitatively closer concepts than time and space are. You see what I mean? Which immediately takes me to your last question, which I connect with the first, which is that, am I talking of time as an abstraction, which once again is in some senses a Kantian inheritance? I think I am studying time only in so far as it is a linguistic convention. In the languages that I read through when studying Mahabharata or any other epic or any other mythology or philosophy, what strikes me is the multiple way in which time is expressed or articulated. And the primary question about time is, can it be actually said? Can it be expressed in language? So for me, Time is a kind of immanent concept in matter, in language. In other words, if you ask me, there is really nothing called time as such. There are a number of experiences, a number of expressions which deal with what we then extrapolate as time. So therefore, it's, the, it's, it's a kind of linguistic conceptual material connection in which I think time needs to be think about, thought about. Just a provisional kind of an answer. The second question that you ask is, of course, uh, are these temporal plural pluralities completely destroyed in modern times? Yes and no. There is no doubt that the hegemony of the modern regime of thinking time and thinking future is immense, even today, even when there has been very stringent critique of development, very stringent critique of uh, 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 progressivism and such like. At the same time, and this is where these 
instances that I take from 20th century of a Muhammad Iqbal or an Ambedkar or a revolutionary nationalist who in the 20th century are actually relating to much, much older traditions of time. So in other words, some pasts in scattered and transmutated forms retain a presence in our present. And I strongly believe that in the archive, in language, in practices, uh, in, in, in linguistic conventions, we do have presences that are not products of modernity. We fail to recognize them because our theoretical framework and our language of expression in some ways have completely lost connection to other kinds of epistemologies. So there, I do think that there is still, you know, operative aspects of the past in the present, globally, uh, is my belief. Now, hierarchy of pre-modern time traditions, especially in context of Islamic rule, uh, which is now historiographically being presented, as you rightly say, as a different form of an empire, as opposed to the modern colonial empire, a cosmopolitical empire, right? Again, I think I mostly agree with that revision in the sense, um, especially from my, I mean, I read some uh, stuff about the Ottoman Empire uh, but I've read more, more in, extensively about the Mughal Empire and other empires in, 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 the, in the South Asian situation. Interestingly, even the Mughal Empire, being a state, did not work with one calendar. It did bring the Hijri to India as a new calendar, uh, the quote-unquote Islamic calendar. But it also continued to use the Turkish 12-year calendar. It continues to use local calendars, the Vikrama calendar and the Saka calendar. And it also actually set up a local new calendar attuned to the, the agrarian seasonal cycle of Indian production. You see what I mean? So the emperor's own rituals would follow a quote-unquote Islamic calendar. And the Muslim orthodoxy would, would try to impose a, a, a kind of uh, religious calendar. But in actual function, functionality of the state, multiple calendars worked. And therefore, this interesting office of the time expert, one who could actually translate between times, which is another way in which one can see the parallel between language and chronologies, yeah. right? So. And of course, at, at many other registers, not at the register of the state, but in terms of uh, uh, pop, uh, uh, subaltern, uh, uh, religious and cultural sects, I, I, uh, a, a very complicated uh, uh, field of in, innumerable kinds of uh, chronologies and time reckonings actually subsisted for the longest time. Even in colonial times, the epochal calendar of the, you know, declining yugas, declining epochs, 19th or 20th century, that was a very, very common idiom to understand the colonial times as the last epoch of the yuga cycle. Right, so it is actually, uh, my hunch uh, is that while uh, all forms of political power seek to, in some senses, control time. The investment in temporal regimes is of a very new kind in modernity, which happens via the work of history. 
basically world history the the bringing of all peoples within one large imagination of history that i think is a qualitatively different kind of temporal politics than the kind of temporal politics we have seen in earlier times i think i think i've thank more or less yeah thank you thank you Thank you very much. Um, I, now, uh, questions uh, start to come in and I, I would read them. Um, for now, the first question come from, comes from Andy Schubert. He's a researcher working in Sri Lanka. And he says, um, thank you for such an interesting and stimulation, stimulating invitation to think more deeply about the temporal. I wonder if you can speak a little bit about how we can think of the temporality of ethical imperatives. In some ways, ethical imperatives, particularly when they are tied to the religious, but it need not always be the case, are thought to be outside time. So I was wondering how you can help us think about the ethical, particularly in how it uh, relates to political action. Sorry if this is not clear. Thank you very much. So should we take some questions together and... Uh would be fine. Then I'd, I'd uh, take a second if, if it's okay for you. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. There's another question from uh, my colleague Ulrike Freitag. She's at the Mid a Middle East historian uh, at the Centro Moderno Orient. And she asks, in response, in your response to Professor Tayob's comments, um, you say, how would you then deal with physical concepts of time if you argue that there is no time as such? Mm hmm. You even want to take a third one or? Sure, sure. Okay, good. Uh, there's a question from Sam, Sam Krinzel. He's based at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. Uh, and he asks, thank you for such a rich and thought provoking paper, which gives us a huge amount to think about. My question is about just one element of this that strikes me. On this point of the mythologies embedded in Western time or the time of the modern that Professor Tayop raised, I was wondering where we place ideas of the Anthropocene in all this. The term seems for its proponents to do some of the work of blurring the bounds of the political, social, human, etc. that you are engaging in here. But it does so through modernity's view of deep time as embedded in and readable through the earth. A, a mythology of scientific time, one might say. Mm -hmm. Does this reinscribe colonial authority over time? Is there a way of thinking through the Anthropocene that could accommodate multiple te temporalities or is it hopelessly rooted in colonial thought? So maybe uh, we take this first yeah. and then uh, come up with the next bunch of questions. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, very difficult questions, all of them, I'm afraid. Um, okay. Um, well, uh, first, Andy, the temporality of ethical imperatives, are they all the same at all times? In that sense, transtemporal, as opposed to politics, which is historical and contextual. A difficult question. Um, I do not believe that ethics I mean, of course, people would say that there's a difference between morality and ethics, and morality may be culturally inflected by, but ethics is in some ways, you know, uh, uh, universal. Uh, but so is the concept of time, in the sense that time is, a, these are concepts that cannot be thought necessarily as within cultures. Because like time, ethics require an encounter with the other, right? As Levinas said, you experience time when you know that you die and the other lives on. So it is an encounter with the other. Ethics is also about the, an encounter with the other. So therefore, it has to necessarily be a supra-local concept, call it universal or not. But does that mean that these are extra temporal concepts? I do not think so. I think that the nature of ethics changes through time fundamentally 
in relationship to the set of things that are called non-ethics. In our times, the standard opposition to ethics is politics, right? Ethics and politics. So it's the, it's the Machiavelli reread by Max Weber, saying that politics is amoral. But it need not be. I mean, the, the Mahabharata example that was I was uh, uh, giving is an example of politics and ethics being in some senses inseparable, which is why the king and the ascetic are literally inseparable. They are like literally two sides of the same coin. So it, at that point, this question will not arise about ethics being transtemporal and politics being temporal. You see what I mean? It's in relationship to, be, to what is non-ethics that ethics has changed. So it is not transtemporal in as far as I understand it. Ulrika, physical concepts of time, I do not quite understand what that means. In the sense that, of course, we age, our body ages, the planet ages, and the mark of that passing of time shows up on our body, on the surface of the earth, right? On the trunk of the tree. But is that time? Or is that just aging? Is it just decay of matter? So physical time, the movement of planets and stars, night and day, are just movements of planets and stars and night and day movement of the sun vis-a-vis -vis the earth. We call it physical time as opposed to what we see written on a calendar. But my, and, and this I agree with Professor Tayyob Abdul Qadir, that time can only be thought of, if not as an abstraction, but as an extrapolation. Which is not to say that it is immaterial. Uh, it, it has materiality. Right, but it's it's the difference between physical time and I don't know what, I uh, idealized time. I'm not sure how that works. So that would be my provisional response to you. Sam, now that is a difficult question about the Anthropocene. Yes and no, in the sense that at one level, I do believe that through at least the last 200 years, Reperiodization of history has happened, right? The idea of early modernity coming up at one point of time, which actually dissociated the relationship between modernity and colonialism uh, and saw early modernity as appearing all across the world in, prior to colonial moment, uh, was pretty powerful kind of statement at in the 1990s. So reperiodization happens, and that is definitely part of our, th our, our kind of thinking time. We keep changing how we divide time in terms of the objects that are of concern. In that sense, talking of Anthropocene as such is a legitimate uh, exercise in the sense that the proposition that the 1950s onwards, some would say, some would say late 18th century onwards, some would say, it is the time of the humans literally changing the planet or transforming the planet. On the other hand, you are also right that it does have a certain imperial uh, uh, um, jurisdiction where the distinction between diverse regions of the world and different peoples and societies of the world in terms of their participation and contribution to Anthropocene are all clubbed together. So the colonial uh, industrial nations of 19th century, the, the slave peoples uh, of the 18th century who were snatched from their own environment, the coastal fishermen of the 20th century in the Indian Ocean area, their participation in the anthropocenic takeover of the 20th century is vastly disproportionate uh, to others. 
so in that sense, yes, I think it is a homogenizing uh, uh, a conceptual thing. Um, but I am also with the fact that the, no, the, the bringing of the non-human on board that has happened with the rise of the Anthropocene idea is something that I, I take very seriously. And I can say for sure that the division between the non-human and the human in this kind of a stark way is again a very recent 200 year, 300 year old phenomenon. Before that, it was possible to, I mean, as I said, the Buddha was born a monkey 16 times before he could, uh, he could achieve enlightenment. You had to have uh, 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 a sen sensibility, which is trans species. So that's not, I mean, so that, that I really celebrate that that question has returned in the name of the Anthropocene. So again, difficult question. I don't have one answer to it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we have another round of uh, two questions. They are also uh, long, so I, I, I'm going to read them also. And um, uh, the first one is uh, by Tiago Pinto Barbosa. He's a research assistant at the University of Bayreuth. And um, he asks uh, actually two questions. Um, do you think it might be productive to think of space time? So in one word, in, instead of thinking in these terms, time and space separately. The same way some would su suggest thinking of nature culture. And could thinking of topological notions of time space help us thereby? The second question is, uh, I was thinking about Irawati Kave's interpretation of the role of women in Mahabharata and how much one can learn from the different interpretations of, for instance, gendered positionalities in that epic. Can the notion of multiplicity of perspectives or experiences help us thinking about time realities in a way that we do not have to think of it in terms of a chronological past, present, future? Mm -hmm. And the uh, second question is by Gail Presby. Um, she's a philosopher from Detroit um, and she asks, um, you suggest that both religion and politics are involved in risk taking, suffering and come to terms with mortality and finitude. But is this always the case? Aren't some political movements about self-preservation? And they focus perhaps mythically on living forever here on earth generationally, while they imagine only others suffer and die. And how to make sense of societies where there are two parties polarized, one saying it wants change and the other one stability. As in the case of Museveni, she refers to Uganda here, literally no change was their slogan. But I thought you were mm -hmm. insisting that both religion and politics are alike in that they want change. They engage in radical risk taking and maybe even believe in unrealistic, the radical ability to change from the past. This may be the case for Iqbal and Ambedkar, but is it true of politics in general? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much again. Uh, uh, Tiago, uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, I would again avoid uh, necessarily working with the given dichotomies or binaries. So space, time, nature, culture, these are very fundamental binaries in which the modern epistemology was constructed. And the internal critique that has come up of, of uh, by say, of especially nature culture division coming both from feminist scholars and uh, coming from um, people like Bruno Latour, who uh, uh, who kind of bring back the who questions of human society as an autonomous this autonomous entity. Uh, I think the next step after that critique, which has been very productively done, I I, I would say. The next step is actually getting out of the habit of necessarily taking these terms together. And this is what I was saying in response to Abdul Qadir's question as well. Why conjoin space time? These may be concepts of very different orders, right? Or we might have other sets of concepts that we, 
uh, 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 want to use. So I would not, I, I think that it is probably uh, 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 rather optimistic, uh, uh, overly optimistic way of saying that if you say space, time, nature, culture, we shall be freed of those binaries. I don't think we will be. Oh, women in Mahabharata is a fantastic question. It is a, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, I don't have the time to go into all that, but only to say that the women characters in Mahabharata are really, really important and central. Uh, but, n but not to say that uh, they are not in a subordinate position in the larger framing of Mahabharata. They are. Uh, um, but they also at times drive the narrative uh, uh, by their will uh, than, uh, uh, than is expected from where their, their social location is placed. In modern times, in the, uh, from the, the whole of 20th century in India, a large number of uh, uh, women scholars, but also women theater practitioners, poets, have actually worked with the women characters of Mahabharata. It's a really, really interesting, uh, yeah, but some other time when we have the time to go into it in detail. Gail, uh, I see where you're coming from. I, I completely understand what you're saying there. Now, you are saying, you're asking two questions. One, do all politics actually want change? And we know from all around us that, in fact, the greater number of political forces are status quoist. They really do not want to change the system. Now, this takes us to the question of what we understand by politics. Now, there is something to the modern world involving political parties, what we call the formal domain of politics, right? Elections, political parties, election funding, a formal representation, constituency uh, satisfaction. I mean, we call it politics by convention, but it is a profession like any other. It's a profession of governance, a profession of conflict management, a profession of... Uh, on the other, I mean, some people make the division between politics and the political. They would say that politics is the formal domain, which is uh, which is not where really politics happens. The political, on the other hand, I mean, Jacques Rancière would say that one is police, the other is politics, right? So that's the kind of uh, uh, play with uh, the exact meaning of what we mean when we say politics. So yes. Of course, not all political entities actually work with transformation. But in a deeper sense, I would say that the meaning of politics is that it's about change, as opposed to what we now call governance or governmentality, which is a different thing. And, and Foucault never confused uh, uh, management or governmentality with politics. These were two different uh, domains, as it were. Uh, the second question you're asking is when I say, you're saying that if I say that politics about is about facing finitude and mortality, am I also saying that those movements which actually are meant for preservation of life and are about defense of the self, as it were, uh, where do they figure? I think I, uh, I think there is a bit of a, I mean, almost all powerful political movements of the world, uh, of for forever really, are in a way about justice. And if justice is translated as uh, self-preservation, uh, a, a kind of restitution, self-restitution, more correctly speaking, then yes, indeed. But we know that the path of justice is uncertain, dangerous, and very often calls for great sacrifices, right? So when I say mortality, I just do not mean death 
by in the in, in in the kind of suicide bombing sense necessarily but that too i mean i mean so many people in anti colonial times have also literally killed themselves i mean walked into the firing line uh for a cause so that's not so unusual but i i don't mean just that i mean to say that the question before politics is really about whether poli- when and where my politics succeeds or fails failure uh, of the whole revolutionary imagination uh, uh, of the last 150 years uh, stands at a point when people have begun to say that really there was no revolution the kind of mega failure of imagination uh, that leads to is what i'm calling the question of finitude incompletion failure and also mortality so even a self affirming politics passes through these questions of limits and failures that's what i was trying to gesture towards i hope that answers partly at least your question Thank you. Uh we have another four questions now mm-hmm. and uh one of them I would now try um maybe uh to the uh, Kadara Swali if you could ask a question yourself um before we do so I ask uh I read the other three questions. Uh one is by Salva Yahya. She's a PhD student of political science at the Berlin Graduate School of Muslim Cultures and Societies here at Freie Universität. Um Thank you very much Professor Banerjee for the very interesting lecture just the question what are your thoughts on modernity's conception of clock time and its intimate relation with the sense of work discipline which marxist historian historian EP Thompson spoke about can we argue that your american understanding of time is closely linked with capitalism and the modern state and therefore conceptions of time also have a bearing on the way in which political structures have developed in the global south or is this a stretch then question number two comes from Abdullah Sunay from Centro Moderna Orient and he asks could you elaborate on what you called the anti-historical and what it does to southern theory or theory from the south and the third one is um, by Abdi Latif Abdallah Um and he asks mine is a simple question about the terms pre-colonial and post-colonial they bother me a lot what should we keep on referring to our times or epochs so as if our times started with the advent of colonialism on our countries and now we would try with uh, Kadara Swale um to ask your question in person um someone needs to switch the microphone on i hope this works If not, then I have to read the question. I try to be more interactive. It's uh, limited our options. I am Kadara Swali, PhD candidate in anthropology. Um, I argue that time has been used in Islam as a weapon. When Muhammad was asked when is the end of time, he waited for a revelation and God said end of times is my concern, full stop. So a quotation. Secondly, the Satan Iblis, after agreeing to differ with God, he requested to be spared from death until end of time. But God refused and instead offered to spare him t- till a specific time instead. What is your take on this? All right, once yeah. again, uh, you are not sparing. uh to the speaker obviously <laughs> all right uh, salba absolutely a uh, clock time as uh, um as described by ep thompson as uh, uh, the rise of labor discipline and the rise of the factory system the industrial capitalism there is actually a lot m- more work that has happened uh, uh, after ep thompson and the most one of the most important uh, uh, work is on actually plantations and time discipline in plantations so i mean one could say that 
labor discipline as the basis of clock time uh, 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 might have had a site which is a colonial site much earlier i mean like this is called, this is like plantations of, uh, of 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 the of the 17th 16th centuries uh, much earlier than industrial clock time uh, came up uh, my own uh, experience of south asia is that even before industry comes up clock time is imposed and uh, the the standard calendar is imposed simply by colonial administrative fiat and one of the most interesting and debate that took place in the early times and it has also to do with labor discipline in some ways is uh, in a hot country like india especially northern india large number of people started saying that we cannot sit in an office and work in the afternoons we are willing to work later in the day but we have to have our nap we have to sit down in the shade and such like and it, there was a big debate uh, on labor discipline even in colonial offices so i think to connect it directly to industrialism purely parts to the factory system might be a little narrow i think we might have to widen our uh, vision and involve uh, colon other colonial locations as well as in terms of a genealogy of uh, uh, but uh, this is not to say that clocks were not i mean there were no uh, management of clock time earlier in other uh, empires is also not true uh, but of course the proliferation of clocks is a very very modern thing um Okay, Abdullah, anti-historical is a bit of a polemical uh, term. I am trained historian by myself, so I read history books. In, I use historical materials in the in 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 the formal sense. But I'm a historian who has all always felt quite constrained by the disciplinary protocols, some of the disciplinary protocols of history. which is not to say i haven't learned from history or learned from historians by no means i've learned a huge lot by anti historical is a rhetorical way of saying that we must break out of the division of time between these structured periods anti historical also to say that time is time and change and movement is not always linear in other words if we see the presences of earlier concepts and earlier traditions in our contemporary it cannot be understood by asking the question of whether we modernity or we lived in the past there are co-presences contemporaneities there is also something that ibn khaldun knew so well that there is always a rise and a fall a retreat and so there is no unilinear movement which is to presumes that everything prior is in some sense causally connected to everything posterior so in or to indicate those constraints and to be able to access contemporaneity of non contemporaries as it were i rhetorically use the term anti historical it's as simple as that nothing very profound there ah uh, yeah pre and post colonial yes yes i i agree with you there i think there has to be a way i mean it's a double bind see that if we in some senses do not acknowledge the constitutive and defining role of modern colonialism we are also denying some forms of justice to a large number of people in the world right on the other hand if we are stuck and obsessed about colonial injustice we do two things one we stop recognizing the injustices that we the court uncourt the people of the south perpetrate ourselves 
and have perpetrated in the past before colonial times. So it's a kind of easy thing to constantly whip colonialism so as to take the eye away from the difficulties and the problems and the troubles of our own doing too, number one. But that's pretty simple. I, I think all of us recognize that. But secondly, I think it also disallows for us from seeing what I was just suggesting. Mm -hmm. The fact that even though at one level colonialism was also epistemological colonialism and it wiped out our connections to other, other traditions of thought, other philosophies, other even other sciences, uh, other ways of approaching the world. But if we have to really understand what was lost by colonialism, we have to take our eyes away from colonialism and actually study those alternative worlds, texts, traditions on their own terms without constantly referencing colonialism. In that sense, dividing the world in terms of pre- and post-colonial can be a self-defeating exercise. On that, I am with you, Abdullah. Other, uh, uh, then, oh, sorry, the, the, sorry, Abdul Latif, was it, was it Abdul Latif who asked the third question, pre and post? Sorry about that. Uh, the last question, so I'm not sure I fully got the question. Uh, in uh, millenarian traditions of where the end of time is really the moment of final justice, yes, indeed, in some senses, God is, God is the one who is timeless, eternal, but presides on time, as it were, and presides on the end of time too. Uh, it can be weaponized, uh, I mean, in the sense that, I mean, we know that much, a, a lot of political struggle in what we call medieval times, again, a bad term, uh, in the, in some of, it, it, but anyway, let's go with it for the moment. In the medieval times, both in West Asia, but also in South Asia, were about competing prophecies, right? Lot many people, lot many communities, rebe rebellious, insurgent communities would actually argue that the end of time is now. It's here and now. And the Mahdi is here. Um, the justice is going to happen now. And the political act is indeed a, a, a God-approved uh, act of justice, uh, of the final judgment. And of course, states and administrators had to uh, manage these counter prophecies, so to say. The different forecasts, the different oracles, the different saints that came up and what we call popular rebellion very often took the form of counter temporal rebellions, right? Saying in, in, uh, in, within the Islamic uh, history, uh, counter-temporal rebellion, saying that this is the time. This is the time for justice. So it was, if if we call, I'm not sure using it as a weapon is a good word, but even if you use that term, it was used by both the orthodoxy, but also the insurgent and the rebel, and the subaltern rebel too. So yes, a time was a site of great political contest within Islam. There is no doubt there. So there again, yes. But weapon, I don't know. Thank you. Um, do you still uh, yeah, have, have time or uh, energy for more? Three more questions. Um, that, uh, yeah. All right, last. Okay, okay we'll do that last, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so th there are um, two. Uh, one is by Susmita, um, Susmita Snatnat, a postdoctoral fellow at Leipzig University. Um, and she asks, uh, thank you very for a very inspiring talk. You talked about co-theorizing political events and cosmic events. What does such co-theorization do to the dominant way of understanding South Asian thinkers you mentioned, like Gandhi, Iqbal and Ambedkar? For example, Gandhi's religious politics vis-a-vis -vis secularism, Ambedkar's thought vis-a-vis -vis Eurocentrism, etc. 
And the second question comes from Shweta Sada. Is it possible to think that maybe plural visions of time migrate to science, literature, poetry and arts and left religion and politics? And the third question would come from Kai Kresse and um, I hope he can switch on his microphone. Yeah. Oh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Patama. Um, I, I was going to pick up on, on your concluding uh, sort of um, general conclusion of, for the task of Southern theory. And there you said it's about recovering a lost past insight and bringing them to bear. And I think in some ways you've shown us uh, through examples on Iqbal and Ambedkar and others from, from the South Asian history context, how to do that. Um, and, and so just to, if we think outside of that region, of course, that also means we could should be thinking of the different various different regions of the global south of these kinds of reservoirs um, uh, as an encouragement. Uh, you didn't say so much on, on language or conceptual sort of, of working with the languages today, but I know that you that is a very important concern for you. But maybe my so my, my question is in somewhat did, if we um, pursue this southern theory also as this way of thinking across traditions as you have performed for us also today do we do we get um does western does in in the end uh, perhaps there's a bit of a feeling does western theory still remain central to some extent or because it's always also in the end then there as a reference point so how do you how do you see that uh, from your perspective um yeah is is, is that uh is, is, does that remain sort of the, the productive interface or how, how, how do you deal with this kind of as an open question? Thank you very much once again. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, thank you very much again. And I'm, I'm really honored at the number of questions that you have for me. Um, uh, so, okay. Uh, Shushmita, uh, co-theorization of the political and the cosmological. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, if by cosmological you want, uh, one thinks of our current concern uh, of uh, thinking about non-humans and non-humans including not just life forms, but also non-life forms. So let's say thinking about the viral and the digital within the same framework. Now, that of course is not something that uh, was that pressing in the early 20th century. So Gandhi and Ambedkar would not, or, or others were not, not of the time where this, the life non-life connection was being made that strongly. That happens much later. On the other hand, uh, when we say the uh, political and the cosmological, uh, it's not, the non-human just does not mean uh, the life and non-life binary, but for instance, huge connections with landforms, rivers, animals, m much more in earlier times, uh, uh, the great meditation on the question of violence is, has to do, has the animal as its, at its center the animal which is either sacrificed or eaten, right? Uh, in, in the longer tradition, uh, some of those do not get as talked about uh, by the 19th and 20th century. In fact, political advice, the most famous case of the Panchatantra, right? The most widely translated South Asian text across the whole world. That's not the Gita, that's the Panchatantra. The Panchatantra are animal stories, but animal stories all about political intelligence, right? So, so it, it is actually um, very much there, though cannot be reduced to the current moment. I think those historical differences have to be kept in mind. Uh, Shweta, of course, plural versions of time uh, as expressed in diverse aesthetic forms is very much central to the question. So when I say mythology and philosophy, it's an artificial division as uh, Abdul Qadir rightly pointed out. Uh, but um, 
there are different genetic, uh, uh, different genres of expression, the treatise, the mythical narrative, the chronology is a genre of expression of time, right? And absolutely, uh, having said that, while there are plural, uh, plural temporalities, no doubt there, as I said in the beginning, time is also always about relations. And therefore, we cannot say Indian time, African time, Western time, da da da. We can't therefore say tribal time, racial uh, time of 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 a, of, a, of caste, uh, women's time. That for me it doesn't work. So similarly, I would not necessarily say literary time, time of painting, time of cinema, time of all these forms play and work with time, but I will not pluralize time in that simplest sense. If you see what I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I'm very clear, but that's what I mean. Kai, yes. Um, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, uh, again, it is actually quite a difficult question. Um, one, I think I did not formulate my last concluding sentence right when I say lost and past traditions. What I'm also trying to indicate that even in our contemporary and in modern times, uh, there are presences, let's not call them pasts, presences that are other than what is expected of a modern entity. Right. Uh, I want to think through with that and thinking with language is one aspect of it because language is really like a, a huge sedimentation of what we quote unquote may call history. It's, if it's, it's how it ac the accretion of meanings, foreign words, cultural exchanges, the accretion of neologisms, new words, um, the places where something cannot be expressed in language and the struggle with those spaces within language. All this is very much a, perhaps a good metaphor to say what, what, how does one think time if one thinks time like language. Uh, while time passes, it also retains, it also returns, but it also leaves traces and presences. So that's what I'm trying to get at. And, and obviously it's not so easy for me to really put it clearly and articulately. And this I think is true not only of South Asia. I mean, I think globally, even within Europe, my, I'm quite sure, or you're American, or what we call the so-called West, I'm quite sure counter presences can be thought about. Now, so when I say thinking across tradition, and when I say that we must not fall prey to uh, epistemological nationalisms, I mean to say that the Western European philosophical tradition is very much one tradition along with others with which I would like to think. Uh, which is not to deny the hegemonic position that that tradition acquired in course of the last two, three hundred years. But there are also other models of thinking across traditions uh, uh, in, in pre-colonial times, once again, sorry for using that word again, where the interface between um, mathematical traditions, between the Arabs, uh, the Sanskrit scholars and the Mediterranean scholars. I mean, that was thinking across traditions with Europe. Uh, but that was a different model of thinking across traditions because it was via tra mutual translations and it was not a hegemonic relationship per se. Right. So 
can we, I mean, I'm not saying that we can go back there. We cannot. Uh, it is an irreversible uh, transformation of the world. But can we remember the possibility that one can one can encounter other traditions as equals? So one intro, good way of doing that is simply to, as, as, and, but it's only an initial step, is to simply juxtapose a number of traditions. Instead of just doing South Asia and Europe, it's always more freeing, more liberating to do South Asia, Middle East and Europe together or, or break up Europe into what is the Mediterranean and what is uh, uh, Northern Atlantic Europe. So I think, a, again, a bit of a creative performance uh, with uh, playing across traditions uh, could be a good initial step. But uh, yes, I mean, Europe is another, I mean, Western tradition is an, a rich, interesting, wonderful tradition. And uh, we should think with it, but not to the exclusion of others and as equals. Thank you very much. I, I think that's uh, a great word uh, or sentence to end. And um, thank you again very much, uh, Professor Banerjee, uh, for your highly inspiring lecture and um, engaging, engaging uh, responses in the discussion. Uh, also, thank you to Professor Tayop uh, for your equally stimulating comments. And of course, also to the audience um, for uh, being with us tonight and uh, all your uh, yeah, very uh, engaging questions. Um, before we conclude, um, I just want to announce that um, next year we will have the third Berlin Southern Theory Lecture. So please stay tuned. Uh, we will let you know about it. Um, and uh, as Kai Kresse said in the beginning, we have recorded the session tonight. Uh, so we will make uh, available the recording soon. Uh, and we will publish the information, the link to the recording on our Institute's websites, uh, and we'll also circulate them via social media. So thank you again, uh, Professor Banerjee, um, and uh, well, a good uh, evening uh, and good night to, to everyone. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Such an engaged conversation. Thank you for having me. Bye.